活泉传气是一个在 Orange County 的 professional fellowship 成员，是呃大学毕业之后到结婚之前。Living Spring 之下还有三个小组是 The Group、Ivy League 跟 Jay Walker， 然后这三组呢又分别以不同的年龄、还有呃住的地方、还有习惯的语言来分。活泉团契聚会的内容是每个礼拜五晚上八点，然后我们会在 Zoom 上面跟大家呃有 Bible Study， 然后也有不同的 Workshop 跟 Seminar。然后我们会邀请不同的 speaker 来跟我们分享，例如 investment 或是 career 方面的事情。然后我们生活中很多大小事，你想要知道的，我们都把它放在我们的 program 里面。所以你来这边可以呃学到非常多的东西，然后有听到非常多不同的 topic。活泉团契对于我来说最 valuable 的地方，就是因为我们彼此之间有很好的 bonding。然后在过去的 pandemic 一年当中，我们有更多分享的时间，然后为彼此带导的时间。然后在这当中，我们真的呃经历到。到神的同在，然后彼此之间互相关怀的那种好的感觉。呃，如果你对活泉团契有兴趣的话，可以看我们的 Facebook page， 还有 Instagram， 然后也可以跟我们教会的 Welcome Team 联络。Hello， 呃、uh, ，我的名字叫做 Crystal。我现在啊、呃，每个礼拜五都会去一个叫做 I V League 的小组聚会。哦，我非常喜欢这个小组，因为我觉得这个小组，呃、uh, ， it's kind of like a transitional place， 因为我们大多数的成员都是最近的什么大学毕业生啊，然后 grad school 毕业生啊。我觉得 it's a perfect place for 我们这种呃、uh, student， 我们可以慢慢 adjust 我们的 identity from like college graduate， 呃、uh, ， college students to like working professionals。我觉得我个人认为最 valuable 的是，我们在这个群组里面，我们有一起玩游戏啊，我们有一起呃开玩笑。我觉得我们有更加的认识彼此。我觉得从那之后，我们每次聊天都会非常的开心，就很像回到了家养的感觉，让我感觉非常的温暖。Hello, my name is Winston Yu, and I'm a member of Jay Walkers. Jay Walkers is one of three small groups within the Living Springs Fellowship, and our small group leader is Ray Cal. Currently, we are going through the Book of Genesis, and we are a group of fun young professionals who value organic friendships, genuine relationships, and having a Christ-centered life. We have around 12 members in our small group, ranging in age from the mid mid 20s to late 30s, and we generally meet on Fridays from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. On top of what you would expect from a solid Bible study, ours also includes icebreakers, sharing, and prayer. Outside of Bible study, our members often exercise, hike, watch movies, and even go on vacation together. We've gone to Seattle, the Central Coast, the Sequoia National Forest, and many other places with many more to come. What I treasure most about Jay Walkers is the friendships and the family we have built. When one of us is hurting, we support one another. When one of us is fortunate, we celebrate with one another. We openly share our deepest struggles and pray for one another. Although many of us have been in this group for years, we're always welcoming to newcomers. If you're interested in joining us, feel free to reach out to either Ray Cow or me. You'll find us both on Facebook. Welcome to church. I am so glad to see you here today. Thank you for choosing to be here and not anywhere else. Whether you're on live stream or if you're playing a replay, I am still glad that you're here today. Let me assure you, you will definitely meet God today. And let's start with today with the word of God from Philippians 4:19. Philippians 4:19. Let me read, and my God will supply every need of yours according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And I'll read in Chinese. Philippians 书四章十九节，我的神必照他荣耀的丰富，在基督耶稣里使你们所需用的一切都充充足足。God will supply all your need according to the riches of His glory. And with that, let us go into worship, and let's have our worship leader to lead us in prayer. Good morning, One Point Five. I'm glad you're here with us today. 
Before we start our worship, let's do a quick prayer together. Dear God, um, uh, thank you for giving us another wonderful Sunday that we are able to uh, come together as one church to worship your name. I pray that you will open our hearts, open our ears, and open our eyes as we worship you and to be able to receive, to understand your will, and to encounter you in a different way uh, in spirit today. So we thank you, God. We want, we want to lift all our voices to you, our praises to you, and we just want to glorify your name alone this morning. We thank you. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's worship.
For staying with us, I hope through the worship God has show up and spoke to you. If this is your first time here, I would like to invite you to scan the QR code and to connect with us. We would love to plug you into a small group. You know, whether if you if it's your first time here, if you just swim by, or you've been here for a long time but you have never found a small group that's suitable for you, welcome to scan the QR code. We have something for everyone. This is important that we plug you into a small group so that we can all grow together and walk this faith journey together. 一起成长,一起陪伴,我们一起加油. And if you are, if you can, join us a little five minutes earlier on, on your live stream or on premiere. Join us on 11.05 on Sunday because we have started our new promo video, new runtime video, where we have each week 
to hold two different people from two different small groups recording their uh, testimony, their sharing about what they promote about their small group. So through the runtime video, you may see some new faces or familiar faces uh, talking, sharing with us about their experience of community. So join us on 1105 on YouTube and Facebook. In the beginning, I share with you the proclamation, the word of God, Philippians 4. Let me read that to you again, Philippians 4, 19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his glory, his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. I don't know if you know the context, but this is written by Paul to the Church of Philippi because the Church of Philippi has been supporting Paul in his different mission. He, they have been sending their uh, financial means to support him or sending workers to work alongside Paul. So, Church of Philippi has poured out their life. Some of the members probably gave their life investment or um, to support Paul for the work of God, for the kingdom cause. And maybe that's you. You've poured out your life. You've done a lot for the church, for the community, for the kingdom of God. You've poured out a lot. And I want to assure you that God has your need in mind. He knows your concern and He will supply all your needs according to the riches of His glory. Or maybe you are bogged down by life, by school, by work, by family, or just by the mundane life. You feel so drained in general and you don't feel like you have enough or if you have extra to invest in the kingdom of God. I want to encourage you that you do. We do have all that we need to pour out into his kingdom. Whether it's in our time that we can care for a small group member that may not have come to our small group for a long time. Or maybe we ourselves haven't committed to any ministry to any small group for a while. Maybe it's time that we commit. Or maybe we can support a cause financially. Maybe it's a global cause like World Vision or a particular nation like Nepal Mission, Mexico Mission, or a cause like uh, Never Ever Give Up Cancer Children, Nigu. Whatever it is, I want to encourage you that God is the God who supply all we need according to the riches of His glory. So we always have enough to, to pour out to others. We always have enough to join the work of God because God Himself will supply all your need. 我们的天父,我们的上帝会亲自地来供应你的需要,充充足足地供应你的需要,加入神国的功. And with that, that is going to announcement today. Uh, every Sunday, starting today, from 9.50 to 11 a.m., 我们的Henry Fett will teach on the book of Galatians, 加拉太书, will have seven weeks, seven Sundays, 他会每一个礼拜天早上, seven Sundays, 9.50 to 11 a.m. on Zoom. So if you're interested in learning more about the Word of God or just studying the book of Galatians, I invite you to join. It will be Chinglish, so it's 1.5 base. Join us. And also, every uh, fourth Sunday now, we have our in-person 1.5 service. I want to invite you to join us in person. I know it's comfortable, it's convenient to worship at home, but our mighty God, He deserves that we just go out a little extra mile, that we go out, we take that step of courage, of faith, that we just go out. Maybe it's inconvenient, but He is worth it. He is the God who deserves our very best. So if you can, join us on 4th Sunday of June because we are preparing to open up on August. So this is to prepare our launch. And with all that said, that's going to a time of offering. Offering is a duty for Christians and Christians only. If you're not yet a Christian, 
I would like to invite you to join us with prayer. And let's pray. I'm oh, sorry, before let's pray. There are two ways of giving offering. One is through the traditional way, check, mailing in check, or the online giving. There are two costs. One is to EFCI for our general fund to support the church operational cost. Or the other one is to EMCI for the mission cost. You know, just because of pandemic, the work of God does not stop. So we will continue to do our mission work globally. And that's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for being our provider. Thank you for the God who supply of our need according to the riches of your glory. And Father God, we pour out a little of what we have. I pray that we will give you all that we have, our time, our energy, our finance, everything, God, we give it to you. And we pray that you use what we give mightily. And we know that is not in vain. You know the tears, you know the joy. And I pray especially for those who may be struggling, who may be suffering, God. I pray that you'll be our strength, you'll be the comforter to us, and you will lift us up, and you will let us know that you are the genuine provider, that you do care. And God, we thank you for your glorious riches in our lives. And God, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And before we welcome our speaker today, Deacon Nick, Let's spend the time to pray for him as he is relocating to Northern California to pay that mama. He has been a blessing for us for 1.5 and for the kingdom of God. We all know him as a brother who is dedicated, devoted, and talented. He always pour out all that he has for the kingdom of God. I remember in the beginning of pandemic, he was the one who set up everything today so that we can do online service. He was the one who set up our website so we can do a lot of online giving online stuff. So let's take a minute to pray for his family for this season. And also let's take one minute to all pray together or type in your prayers and comments. Let's just take a minute to pray for him and I'll conclude with a prayer for him. Let's pray for Nick. Father God, we thank you for this brother who is so talented and so devoted, who is a humble servant and leader in our 1.5 ministry. Father God, we know that there is a very difficult story happening, but we know that you have your beauty. We know that Nick's father is in your hand. 而我们知道接下来还有好多事情要处理。In this difficult time of transition, of mourning, in this season of life, God, I pray that you will walk with their family, give them a peace that surpasses all understanding, a supernatural peace. And Father God, I pray that you will raise up all the help, all the support around him, so that he can have a strong community who will catch him, who will just be there to support him, to be a cheerleader for him. And God, I pray that wherever he goes, God, he will continue to be a greater blessing to the community around him. And Father God, I especially pray for Whitney as well, as a wife that is tra who is traveling with his husband to a, a new place, to a new phase of life. God, I pray that you will, be her, you will give her emotional support and that you will give their family wisdom to navigate through this season of life. And God, I pray for clarity and you give them the guidance. And God, we thank you. We, we pray for extra grace, extra favor upon Nick and Whitney. And Father, again, bless the family with a lot of peace and joy again. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And with that, let's welcome Deacon Nick. 
All right, dear brothers and sisters, thank you for uh, allowing me to be here and share a word of God with you. And today, I want to approach the sermon a little bit differently, where I want it to be a conversation and a dialogue instead of me preaching to you. So before we start, um, I'd love to open with a word of prayer. So let's bow our head and let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this morning. Thank you for giving us this fellowship. Thank you to have the opportunity to be here to worship you, to learn your words, to understand the great gift that you have given us. And help us listen and help us learn the words that you're speaking to our hearts so that we can have the strength and confidence to follow you. We pray all these in Jesus' name. Amen. As you guys know, uh, I will be leaving Southern California very soon, so this will likely be my last message that I get to share here uh, with you guys. Um, as I was praying and I reflected deeply about what is the message I want to share, um, something just spoke to me, um, and it really inspired me to think about what is our greatest hope in life, and what is our greatest gift in life, and what is God's will in our lives. So today I want to share about the greatest gift. Before we start, um, this sermon will be a little bit different. There's not going to be a PowerPoint, and there's not going to be any video animations, but in this case, I want us to open up our Bibles, either through your phone app or through a physical Bible. So let's turn to Romans chapter 10, and we'll start with verse 5. So Romans chapter 10, verse 5, the message of salvation to all. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So Paul is writing to the Christians in Rome in this particular passage, um, writing for the salvation for his fellow Jews. In the text leading up to this from verses 1 to 4, Paul illustrated his desires and prayers for his fellow Jews to come to know Christ, um, that the Jews beforehand were just like him before he met Christ, even to the extent of persecuting Christians acting on behalf of God. So this passage picks up in, the verse, uh, in verse 5, where Paul referenced Moses from the book of Leviticus, chapter 18, verse 5, where Paul affirms that, yes, whoever can abide by the commandments can be deemed righteous. So even in the days of Old Testament, no one disputed this. If you can follow the law perfectly, you are righteous. Even in the New Testament, no one disputed this fact as well. In fact, um, the Pharisees and the Jews went through a great extent to try to obey the law, even down to a T. So if you remember, there's a story in Luke chapter 10, where a teacher, an expert of the law, came to ask Jesus a question. The question he asked was, hey, how can I get eternal life? Now, do you remember how Jesus uh, responded? He says, you tell me, how do you get e eternal life? And this teacher and expert of the law, he answered, Love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus then said to him, Okay, do it and you will live. And how did the uh, expert reply him? Who is my neighbor? Then Jesus continued to tell the parable of the Good Samaritan. And Jesus illustrated that the standard of loving your neighbor extended greatly beyond what's possible within the human heart. See, the problem is no one can follow the law perfectly. We can see from this example, the standard for fulfilling the law is impossible when it comes to human being. Actually, Paul said this in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, by one's own effort, one's own will, 
and one's own action, it is impossible to reach righteousness by oneself. This is why God sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us, the one that is perfect and can be justified by God. Now, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, it talks about the dangers of someone who solely relies on the law to become righteous. Here it says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. So we know that by human nature, we cannot fulfill the law. So then, how does one become righteous? We become righteous through faith. In the following verse, if you follow your Bible along, Paul further explains that righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up. What Paul is actually saying here is that the righteousness by faith is not about doing the work. It's not about someone going to heaven to pull Jesus down here to do the work or someone going to the abyss to bring Jesus up. In fact, it's not about you having to work to experience salvation. It's not about what you do. It's about what's been done for you. And therefore, Paul further explains that righteousness is in the word. The word is near you. The word is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. So what Paul is illustrating here is that God's righteousness is not earned. It's not because of what we do. It's not something that we can even work for. Instead, it's as close to you, as near to you, as your words. It's what you believe, and it's what's in your heart. It's what you proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So perhaps let's take a moment and think back to a time, a time when you felt like you couldn't come to God for whatever reason. It could be you felt like you weren't good enough. You felt like you made a mistake. You felt like you were judged by someone else, either in the church or in your fellowship. Or perhaps this happened even before you knew God. You said, I'm a sinner. I'm not good enough to come to church. I can't be a Christian. You know, there's times where I've thought I've made a mistake so big that I can never return to God. And that's actually precisely the same mentality that the Jews had, where they thought that they can earn their way. Right? So in the same way, we feel like, hey, I have to be done right by God before I can even come to him. It's like a patient saying to the doctor, when I'm healed, then I'll go to the hospital. It doesn't really work. So the truth of the matter is that we will never be perfect. We will never be good enough, and we will never be able to earn our righteousness or our salvation. So what do you think we're communicating to God when we have those mindsets that I have to earn it? God loved you even before you knew him, and God loved you when you were the furthest away from him because it is what's been done for you. So the point is that our God's righteousness is 100% a gift for those who believe, and it's a gift you cannot earn, and it's a gift that's freely given to you. So the difference between our faith and the faith of any other religion is very, very different, because every other religion says, you need to do this so you can become something. You need to do that so you can become something. But in our belief, the difference is it is done. There's nothing that you can do. It's as simple as that. Salvation is given to those who believe. So, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you and encourage you that our salvation is never based upon performance. It's not about what you do. It is purely based on the kindness and grace and love of our Father. So I am praying for you that at any time, that when you have the slightest doubt of, I'm not good enough, or I don't measure up, I don't know how to face God, I pray that in those moments you hold on to these truths, 
that you are a child of God and salvation is given to you because what Christ has done. So the first, the first part is you cannot earn your salvation. It is purely a gift, and it's the greatest gift that we can ever receive. As we continue, uh, please follow along in your Bible. Let's um, go to verse 10. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We see here Paul re- reiterates this truth, right? If you look back in chapter, uh, in verse 9 and verse 10, you can see that there's a parallel here. Your heart believes and your mouth confesses. You can see that it's the combination of these two things. Because in its absence, if you only have, if you only confess with your mouth, but your heart doesn't actually believe, that's a problem, right? Because you're performing a ritual. Um, however, with a combination of your belief in your heart and a confession in your mouth, that's a justification for our salvation and our righteousness. And as we continue, the scripture further affirms that everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all. Bestowing his riches on all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What a powerful verse. And that's the core of our belief. In verse 11 to 13, it proclaims that it is through faith in Christ and proclaiming that this gospel is for all, for everyone, not just for the Israelites, but for everyone who believes in him. That is the truth. That's also confirmed by Joel chapter 2, verse 32, where it says, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, a rhetorical question, right? Who qualifies as all? Who are our neighbors? Who are the people that are in need of this gospel? As Paul laid the foundation that we are all in need of the gospel to be deemed righteous, and this salvation is meant not just for the Jews, but for everyone, then what is our call to action? What is your call to action? So as we continue in verse 14 to 15, Paul raises a series of questions. He then says, How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So what is Paul explaining here? He asked a number of questions, but let's follow the logical sequence here. First, Paul starts to ask, okay, we now know the, we now know the foundation of the salvation. We know it's for everyone. Well, how would someone believe if, um, or how is someone able to call on Christ if they have not believed? And how will they be able to believe if they've never heard it? And how will they hear if no one preaches to them? And how will someone preach if they're not sent? So in other words, in order to have a confession one must have faith in Christ. But in order to have faith, one has to know and hear the message of Christ. In order to hear the message about Christ, somebody has to preach that to them. And in order to preach, there has to be people who are sent. So according to the Pew Research Center, um, only 31% of the world population identify themselves as Christians. That includes Catholics. That means there are five billion people, two in every three people in this world, who have not accepted God as their personal savior. So think about that number, right? Every every three people, there's two of them that have not confessed, that their hearts have not believed. 
and then according to the Joshua Project, there are 3.28 billion people who are unreached, who, who may not even have a chance to learn about God, who even have a chance to receive the gospel, who even have a chance to be saved. And let's take a step back, right? Can you think of the people that you know, maybe your relatives, maybe your family members, maybe your friends, your coworkers, who have not come to know God? Who will be sent? Who will preach to them? You know, we as a follower of Christ, you know, each and every one of us is called by the Great Commission. Jesus was very clear who is to be sent, right? If you think about uh, the Great Commission, and as followers of Christ, as his disciple, right, it is commissioned to us to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So if you have ever wondered what's God's will in your life or what is your purpose in life, look no further. Look no further, my friend. We are the messenger of the good news. And it is our race to run. Because we have received the greatest gift of all. We have received the salvation. The question is, are you the messenger to deliver the news? You know, in the, in the past nine years, um, I've been at EFCI. So I served officially, unofficially, um, and that's a message that I've taken to heart, right? It's, um, it's a reason why we serve, right? It's we may reach the one, right? And so that the people who have not had a chance to hear about God has the opportunity to hear about God. You know, whether it's going through, um, when I was in the student ministry, um, uh, we had a lot of uh, students from mainland China who never had a chance to hear the gospel. We had the chance to, uh, to go through Christian, uh, basic Christianity. And as I took uh, leadership positions, right, a young professional, we emphasized to the coworkers, it's about the unreached. It's not about how comfortable we all are, and it's not about the activities we do. It's about the people who are not here yet. And even if you think about our website, right, our social media, why do we do all of these things? It's, for, it's just for that one person. If it reaches the one person, if it reaches through any of these means, if we reach the one, then it's worth it. So in this process, I faced many setbacks, many challenges, many long nights. But I found joy in every moment. Why? Because it's always about reaching the one. And you may ask the question, well, who is the one, right? And then the one I think about is actually the parable of the lost sheep where the shepherd left the 99 to go after the one lost sheep. So I ask you, where is the heart of God? Where's the heart of Christ? The heart of Christ is going back for the one. Uh, just a disclaimer, uh, I'm not a pastor. I didn't get paid to be here. So there's zero conflict of interest in sharing this message. But instead, today I stand in front of you, not as a deacon, not as a church leader, but as a brother, a friend, and a peer, to share with you that the greatest joy you can have in life is to bring joy to your creator, right? The greatest joy you have in life is for you to witness a lost soul being saved. The greatest joy you can have in life is when you see someone's life being transformed because they found God. There is no greater joy. So I hope that you can take this message with you to know who and what you are living for. I want to encourage you and challenge you. Take some time and reflect and think about your life, your fellowship, your small group, even your church life. Has it been about me, about my comfort, 
about my own experience, or is it about reaching the one lost sheep? Are you willing to be the bridge, to be the messenger, to bring reconciliation between man and God? In other words, if we are truly the followers of Christ, and if we're truly his disciples, what should our focus and priorities be? Should it be on how well someone led Bible study? Should it be how fun of activity our fellowship has? Should it be how great the worship session actually is? Or should it be someone preaches very well versus that other person? I'm not discounting the importance of these things, but is that the priority? Is that the most important thing that we need to think about? What is of the utmost importance? And what is closest to the heart of God? So I invite you to take some time this week to examine our hearts and our priorities. And I want you to pray. Pray that God reveals what is his heart for his people. And are you willing to ask God for more compassion, for more love, just like the shepherd in the parable of the lost sheep? To leave the 99 to go after the one lost sheep. So I want to close with a story. A little more than a month ago, um, I experienced a deep, great loss. I lost my hero. I lost my father. I have many, many troubling thoughts. I have doubts. I even have despair that I don't really know how to explain it. I didn't understand the reason why. And then through the continuous support and prayers from our close friends, family, church family, we were getting through on a day-by-day basis. And in the deep depth, depth of my sorrow, uh, one of the pastors spoke to me, and he challenged me. He said, don't ask why. Don't think about and don't reflect on how he died. It doesn't matter. Focus on how he lived. And I remember he told me to think about how he lived and how he honored God with his life, his work, his everything. As we put up the website to honor my father, we asked, um, we asked anyone who is willing to share some stories and words that they want to remember my father by. Originally, you know, we didn't think that there would be too many, but after about a month, hundreds of these stories started to pour in. And it's about the work that he had done. He taught the word of God for 15 years in Sunday school. Um, many members wrote about how they received salvation because of the conversation that they've had or the extra time he spent after small group to counsel. The broken families that were brought back together and him serving the most underserved community in his church. Yet, from what I remember, at every opportunity, he exemplified Christ with great humility. In his last written message for the church, uh, it was for a Mother's Day event. Um, He wrote about my loving grandmother, uh, of his adoration for her, but also the burden that was always on his heart. The reason is that uh, she has been a uh, devout, uh, devout religious person who has worshipped idol religiously and meticulously for about 80 years in her life. So my father spent years upon years praying for her, sharing his faith with her for decades without ceasing. Now, my grandmother is a strong, independent woman, strongly opinionated. She said, no, thank you. I do not want this. <laughs> I do not want this belief. That's yours. You keep it. I'll keep what's mine. However, in the year 2003, it was perhaps the worst time for our family because we had just moved to the States and my father couldn't work and he was deeply depressed. So my grandmother decided that she wanted to come and visit him. And even though my father was in his great despair, 
he was slightly depressed, but he still felt this calling in his heart to share. So he decided to give it one more try. And in that moment, um, my grandma in that visit got baptized. She confessed with her, uh, with her mouth and believed with her, with her heart. She was the one lost sheep that God had placed in his heart. So let's re- reflect back to the word of God. Right? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. As we're reminded that our salvation is purely a gift from God and that this salvation is for anyone who believes, we are compelled to share the good news to the world that needs it the most. Who is your neighbor? If you're already out there sharing your faith, I'm praying hard for you because you are fighting a battle. And I pray that God gives you strength and you continue. If you have been sitting on the sidelines, I encourage you to share your faith, get involved. And if you really don't have the gift of evangelism, equip someone, train them, send them. Send them for the kingdom of God. Today, as a fellow believer, a friend, and a brother, I challenge you to make the most dangerous prayer you can ever make because God will change your life if you make this prayer. The prayer is, God, use me. God, send me. I am willing. It is time for our generation to run the race. It's our turn. It's our time to focus on the things above, to be the messenger with beautiful feet, to share the greatest gift that you receive so freely. It is our turn. For how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. If this message spoke to you today, I invite you to join me and I welcome you to join me in the following prayer. Let's pray the most dangerous prayer. Father, we're reminded that you have given us the greatest gift, which is salvation through your son, Jesus. This gift is not selfishly ours. It is for all, for everyone. I pray that you will give us a heart of deep, deep compassion, that you will give us the urgency in recognizing the great work you have set forth for us. So God, I pray that you send me and I pray that you use me. I pray that you will give us the courage and strength to share your gospel to the ends of the earth, to reach the lost sheep, every last one, Father, I pray that you give us a heart that feels your compassion. Father, I pray that you give us a heart that draws near to yours. Father, I pray that you give us a strong calling that may our feet be the beautiful feet that carries your good news. I pray all these in Jesus' name. Amen. In the fullness of your grace
Oh, God.